Praise God. I'm thankful for God's love this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. He is so, so good to us. If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, that's a chapter that I've already preached from a few times here. Maybe, uh, maybe no other chapter I've preached from more times actually uh, so far. But today I just want to, I just want to briefly share some simple truths about baptism. And uh, I know sometimes a pastor says briefly share and he doesn't really mean it. But you know that if I say it, I really do mean it, all right? It's going to be brief. It's just a pretty simple message with some basic uh, rudimentary truths about baptism and why, why, we're, why we're going to celebrate what we're going to do here in just a, a few moments. We're going to read verses 18 to 20 uh, together in a moment. By the time we get to the part of, of the narrative that the verses that we're going to read together this morning cover... Jesus has, has fulfilled his earthly purpose. He, he has died on the cross as the perfect lamb, the sacrifice once for all, as Hebrews tells us. He freely gave his life for the, the very people who were taking it, for the people who had not even been born yet, but he knew would sin against him for me and for you. But he has died on the cross, raised from the dead. And if we were to read all of, all of Matthew 28, the entire chapter this morning, we would read about how the, the two Marys went to the tomb and received the news from the angel that Jesus wasn't in the tomb because he wasn't dead anymore. He had risen from the dead. We would read about how they ran to tell the disciples. We would also read about how the guards were paid off and instructed to spread the story that... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> that Jesus' disciples had come and stolen his body while they were sleeping. Matthew 28 covers a, a big chunk of time between Jesus' death and resurrection and his ascension back into heaven. He wasn't going to be with his disciples anymore. He wasn't going to be there to teach them and to answer their questions and to help them along. He told them that the Holy Spirit would be coming to do that. Jesus wasn't going to be participating in physical, earthly ministry anymore. That, he made very clear, was up to his disciples now, up to his followers. And he left them with a challenge, really what could be called the job description for every person who is a follower of Christ from those earliest disciples all the way on down to us here this morning. It has become known as the Great Commission. Let's read it together this morning. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You may wonder why the church has days like today. What's so great about baptism? Why do we do it? There are a whole lot of reasons, and we'll talk about some of those too. But I think that the passage that we just read is probably the most important one. We do it because... Jesus said to do it. John 2 records Jesus' first miracle of turning the water into wine. In the account, Mary asks Jesus to do the miracle. And then she just looks over at the servants and she says, do whatever he tells you. You remember that? She just looks, she says, do whatever he tells you. In fact, it was right after Jesus said, it's not time. I don't know if I should do that. I'm not going to do that. And she just kind of ignores it. She says, do whatever he tells you. For the Christian, those words, those are words to live by. Do whatever he tells you. Really, it's, it's key to our happiness, peace, joy, to a, a fruitful life. If we can simply live our lives surrendered to the idea that we're going to do whatever Jesus tells us, we will enjoy his blessing. So that's the biggest why. 
But it's all a part of, of Jesus' great commission to his followers. As a church, as Christians, we are not fulfilling the purpose that God has for our lives if we are not fulfilling the great commission. Would you agree that a life lived without purpose is really no life at all? And I'd say that a life that is lived for any purpose other than the one that God has for you is just like living a life with no purpose at all. Because you will never be fulfilled in anything other than passionately following after God's purpose for your life. I believe that God has a, a collective purpose for all of us, for the church as a whole, for everyone who is a believer. But I believe God also has a specific purpose for each of us as individuals, a special calling that God has just for you. And you should know what it is. But that isn't what we're talking about this morning. What we're talking about this morning is, is part of that collective purpose that we mentioned. This applies to everyone in here who is a, is a follower of, of Christ, a Christian. It's the Great Commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize them, teach them to obey my commandments. That commission is for every Christian. There is no such thing as a bench warmer on God's team. Uh, in fact, there's not even any bleachers uh, in the game. It's not a spectator sport. Everyone has to get involved. There, there aren't enough players as it is, right? The Bible says uh, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. If your neighbor doesn't know about Jesus, it's your job to tell them. I was just struck yesterday. Uh, Andrew, I don't know if you know this, the neighbor on the other side of Frank. He just passed away yesterday. Uh, ambulances came in. I wondered what was going on. He had a heart attack and he died. And uh, Nancy and the kids had met them. I hadn't even met them. I didn't know him. And he passed away. And I don't know about his eternal state. He wasn't very old. Had a heart attack that quick. If your coworkers don't know your testimony, you're shirking your responsibility to the Great Commission. If we as a church, if we're not seeing new converts come to know Christ and get baptized and begin learning and growing as disciples, we're nothing more than just a social club. And sadly, there are a lot of churches like that. And now, those things that I've said, let that, that, that conviction to passionately fulfill the Great Commission that I believe we're probably all feeling from the Holy Spirit, let it pierce you and spur you to action because we're gonna abruptly change gears. Today is a day of celebration. Today we're celebrating as we fulfill the second part of Jesus' clear instruction to his disciples. Make disciples and now it's time for a baptism. For some reason, it seems like we don't put a whole lot of emphasis on this in the holiness movement. Uh, some in our circles completely ignore both Jesus clear example and command to baptize in literal physical form. Scripture is abundantly clear on the issue. That's something that I have never understood. I don't, uh, it's, it's an important part of becoming a disciple. It's literally a part of the great commission. But why is that? What is it? Uh, why is it so great? Other than the fact that Jesus told us to do it, we want to do what he says. Why do we do it? Baptism is basically a testimony of what Jesus has done for you in washing away your sin. Baptism doesn't save anyone. It doesn't guarantee someone a, a ticket to heaven. Uh, a lot of people in Christendom through the years have, have treated baptism that way. I recently, I think it was Daryl Stetler was sharing the story about, he heard an interview with uh, Billy Ray Cyrus, and they were talking about his daughter, um, what's her name, Miley Cyrus, her wayward ways. Anybody knows anything about that? She's pretty wild. And Billy said in the interview, he said, I really don't know what happened. We had her baptized when she was a little girl. And uh, just kind of that idea that baptism is just this magical formula that's supposed to take care of everything. But I encourage people not to be baptized unless they are committed to what it really means. I'm not interested in how many people I can dip in water. That does, that's not important. I want to know that people are really becoming 
followers of Jesus. That's what baptism is about. It's not some magical ceremony or just some empty ritual. The story is told about the baptism of King Angus by St. Patrick uh, in the middle of the 5th century. Sometime during the the rite of baptism, St. Patrick leaned on his sharp pointed staff and he didn't realize that it happened to be resting on the king's foot and he, he stabbed the king's foot with his staff. After the baptism was over, St. Patrick looked down and he saw a puddle of blood. Then he he looked and he realized what he had done and he begged the king's forgiveness. He said, why did you suffer this pain in silence? Why didn't you say anything? And the king said, I thought it was just a part of the ritual. (laughs) That is not the way that baptism works. Baptism isn't some salvation-giving work, something that we have to endure to get to heaven. It doesn't include pain or penance or anything like that at all. I've known a few people who are deathly afraid of water that might beg to differ. But we're going to look this morning at what baptism does mean, what it does do for you. Baptism does at least four things. Number one, baptism declares your faith in Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was saved right then. And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Beautiful. Love that story. So baptism says... I believe and I'm willing to admit it. In our house, we enjoy some pretty delicious cooking. Uh, I think we've all been beneficiaries of that from time to time. Uh, Every once in a while, Nancy will try a new recipe. And most of the time, it's good. Sometimes we decide, ah, that's, that's not our favorite. But sometimes, the new dish is so delicious that everybody loves it. And it just quickly shoots to the top of our favorites list. And a lot of times, if that happens, it'll make an appearance when we have guests come to visit, right? Because it's just too good not to share. We enjoyed it so much that we want other people to enjoy it with us. When we testify about what God has done for us, it's a lot like sharing a favorite recipe with friends because it's just too good not to share. Baptism is just one way of testifying of your faith in Jesus Christ. Most of us here have already been baptized. Uh, We should still be sharing about the hope that we have in Jesus because it's just too good not to share. Baptism declares your faith in Christ. Number two, baptism symbolizes your death to your old life. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 to 3. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? That sure doesn't sound very exciting, does it? Baptized into death? I thought this was supposed to be exciting and celebratory. The reality is that our life before Christ was death. We were on the path to destruction and death. And we were spiritually dead. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Paul says, Life before Christ is like being dead in our sins. We might have thought that we were really living, but we were just following the course of this world. We might have thought that we were choosing our own path, but Paul was right when he said we were actually following the prince of the power of the air. I grew up in a home where I wasn't allowed to follow the prince of the power of the air. Uh, Anybody else grow up in a home like that? I'm grateful for it. But you know what? That isn't what saved me. I wasn't allowed to do certain things, but I still wanted to. My sin left me just as guilty and just as dead inside 
as anyone else that didn't have the privileged upbringing that I did. To both of you, Jackson and Emma, who are being baptized today, you have grown and are growing up in a Christian home. Even so, it's important for us to admit our sin and recognize the futility and emptiness of life without Christ. One reason why it's so important for us to be honest about who you were as a sinner is so that you can fully recognize and celebrate who Jesus is as your Savior. Baptism says, I've repented of my sins and I am willing to prove it. The life that you lived before he came into your life was just a life of spiritual deadness. I guess dying to your old life isn't so bad after all. Dying to death? That sounds like life. And that's the next thing that baptism does. Baptism not only symbolizes your death to your old life, number three, right. baptism announces your new life in Christ. The next verse, after the three that we just read in Romans chapter 6, Romans 6, 4, it says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. <laughs> Paul says that baptism is symbolic of being buried with Christ in his death and raised with Christ in his resurrection. When you got saved, you didn't just die to your old life. You were brought into a new life in Christ. In John 3, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and he called it being born again. He said, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. We are probably accustomed to that term, born again, as Christians. To the uninitiated, it probably sounds kind of weird. Obviously, Jesus wasn't talking about being physically reborn. If you're a Christian, you've been born again, but obviously you're still the same age. You, you, uh, you didn't turn into a baby again. No doubt your attitudes and your desires have changed, but you still look the same. Uh, the, the work that Christ did in your life it was a work that's on the inside. It's a, it's a spiritual work. To be born again means to be brought into new spiritual life. Just like you can see the effects of the wind, but you can't actually see the wind, you can see the effects of someone who has been spiritually reborn, but it's not something that you can physically see. That's where baptism comes in. Baptism is this outward, highly visible symbol to everyone looking on of what Christ did on the inside. It is a public testimony that you have died to your old life and you have been raised to walk in newness of life. It's, it's, it, I was talking to Jackson. It's like when you got saved, when you turn your life over to Christ, Jesus gave you a, a bath, a cleansing on the inside. And what you do outside, it's showing like an outward cleansing, saying this is what Jesus did on the inside. Baptism says I'm a new person and I'm willing to. To live it. Baptism announces your new life in Christ. And number four, baptism celebrates your inclusion into God's family. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all were made to drink of one spirit. Baptism says, I belong and I'm willing to show it. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. Does, nothing else matters. If you are a born again believer, when you get baptized, you are baptized into the body of Christ. You are a brother or sister of all of us on equal footing. Jackson, that means you're my son and you're also my brother, right? The ground, one person put it like this. I don't know who said it first. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. <laughs> Baptism speaks to that truth. We're all baptized into one body. We're all a part of the same family of God. Our brother and sister here, they want to be baptized today. And in so doing, they are saying to their family, to their friends, to all of their brothers and sisters in Christ and everybody here, I believe and I'm willing to admit it. I've repented of my sin and I'm willing to prove it. I'm a new person and I'm willing to live it. I belong 
and I'm willing to show it. The rest of us, we're not getting baptized today. Maybe you've already been baptized. Maybe you've been saved for a long time already and, and God has spoken to you and said, hey, you, you need to be baptized. I command it in my word. If that's you, come talk to me. We'll get you on the schedule for sure. But all of us are to be doing our part to fulfill the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. If you're not, ask God to help you fulfill the purpose that he has for your life.